Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, Friday evening uh, Dharma sessions. I'm really very uh, honored and privileged to be able to share with you this topic, which is on, sometimes on people's mind, sometimes it's not. Uh, so, uh, in fact, individually, many of us helping uh, helping the uh, women who want to go forth in many, many ways, which sometimes we don't even realize, like picking up a nun from the airport, or when there's a visiting nun, to find a place for her to stay, or a nun who wants to go for a further studies, or attend a conference, and we have been chipping to collect the money for them. So individually, we have been doing all that. Sometimes even the Dharma brother who says, I've been helping uh, some of the monks uh, in monasteries, monk training centers. He said, maybe I would like to also help the nuns. And he will ask me for the address of any nun training center in Nepal or Tibet, which we will give them the address. So, so how we, was it that we have come together, a few words of us, come together collectively to see how we can have a more systematic way of helping uh, these women who want to go forward into the uh, spiritual life, spiritual path. So in fact, it was uh, Venerable Ananda Jodi who wanted to, who was himself helping some of the uh, renunciants he and his uh, chief venerable in Metajang uh, Hermitage, they were helping some of the nuns, giving them a place to stay uh, and uh, other requisites and support as well. So one day he found that there was one nun, a, a, a camp receptor, who, was, uh, who had lost her sight. She was an accountant, a very young girl, uh, who went forth and be a, uh, a preceptor and she needed to come from Penang uh, quite often or from a good change she's doing the training and with a master in coaching so she had to come quite frequently to KL to do uh, to get uh, medical treatment not only for eyesight but for other conditions as well so she needed even a place to stay or uh, transport from the airport and all that. So he was asking us whether we could help this girl. And she needed to uh, go to the office, to go to the National Association for the Blind, to get certain facilities, uh, special computer programs you need to modify so that it's not seeing but hearing uh, the computer, the voice synthesizer. So all these things she did. So a few of us took her and helped her in this way. And then we started thinking how we can give uh, support not only to this particular nun, but to nuns in general, uh, in Malaysia and Singapore. So that's how we got together. And uh, at first we just started by email. Just email to each other what we need to do and all that. That was in January this year. By April, we already found a tentative place where uh, we could have a temporary place for, for them to stay. Uh, and Bante even set up a blog in April, in, sorry, in May, I think, May, uh, so that we can put in the blog all the information for, to share with everybody. Uh, so now, they're just hoping to, to start this center. Uh, they, so that it's, it's not a, a, a permanent place for the nuns because it can be quite small, but it, at least it's a one-stop center where uh, if they come back from overseas to, to visit their relatives, they don't have to stay with friends or relatives, or sometimes we will pick, put them in Mahayana temples because that's the only place where they can put women, because most of the Theravada temples, the places don't have place for nuns. So sometimes we put in Reverend Sinkan place, and then sometimes a uh, friend's house and all that. Huh? So, so uh, basically that was how it started. Uh, let, let us go through uh, this thing. Huh? So that was what I shared with you. They are from the Vivekananda Monastery in Bukit Matajam. So, 
so I covered that already. So uh, they find that uh, these women they have very little monastic guidance and support, uh, and very little companionship. They were much alone, very isolated. They don't know each other, uh, and they don't have uh, much command of reverence. Just like we normally, we would have more uh, respect and reverence to the monks, you know, because we don't have fully ordained nuns. So they are mo mostly like Mechis in Thailand, we call them Mechis, or Siladaras, or here they are they, they're white, white uh, uh, called the, the AA preceptors. So they, they seldom take uh, much leadership role in the communities. And then they don't have uh, guidance or religious activities that they can conduct for themselves. Uh, and they are timid and they are self-conscious about what they need to do. So it, many of them end up as helpers in the monasteries uh, in which they find it not, not suitable for them. And sometimes they are so disheartened that they disrobe as well. Or they go overseas and get uh, ordained overseas. Huh? Or they go to a, a different tradition, Mayana, Vajrayana traditions. Huh? So as one Rinpoche, we were in Mongolia for the last uh, two, uh, two uh, in zero 08, I think, in Mongolia, uh, Sakadita Conference. There was one Rinpoche who shared with us. He said uh, this, the, the dual Sangha should be brought back because it's just like an aeroplane which has only one wing to fly and it won't be able to fly. So it need two wings to be able to properly fly and the wings should be of the same length and same size then you have a very stable flight, isn't it? Huh? or it's just like a, a, a chair with four legs and then you have just one leg taken away so the chair won't be stable so once you have a four-legged chair it will be very stable and it will be very successful and whatever you want to achieve you can achieve better with the four-fold sangha you call that so that means the, the, the monks, the nuns the male devotees and the female devotees. This four will make the tradition very firm. Huh? <coughs> so by not tapping women who are keen to bring forth, we are losing a very large Dhamma Dutta source. Huh? Because many of the women, they are more nurturing in nature. They work very well with children. And even female devotees, will be more comfortable coming to them and asking, telling them their, their problems, sharing with them family problems and all. So they can be more approachable than when they try to approach a monk. There might be a barrier there, more difficult to open up. And then moreover with a monk, they need a chaperone. They cannot be alone. So then there's no privacy and they cannot really open up. Say suppose they have a husband who beats them up for, for 20 years and that they just want to tell someone so if they want to approach a monk they, they, they might hesitate eh, to say the person who loves me the most is beating me up but if they want to share with another woman they find it easier to, to open up to, to tell their problems eh, and to get help uh, so we always feel that uh, the monks shouldn't uh, feel threatened when women uh, become nuns and who gets some of the support from the lay devotees because if the, the, woman, uh, the monks and nuns work together and expand, expand the devotees say previously they had only uh, 50 devotees but the, if the monks were to work alone it would be a big burden on them and they cannot cover so much ground uh, reach so many devotees, so the devotees will say remain at 50 or 60, it won't grow that much. But if they have two wings and they work together, they would expand their devotees to maybe 100 or more than uh, 200. So then the cake becomes bigger and everybody has a bigger share of the cake, isn't it? Huh? Ah, so nobody will lose in that situation. It's a win win situation. Uh, 
So I already mentioned how we got support. Uh, uh, we started this uh, support level uh, network. Uh, how was that? Uh, so in April, uh, we uh, we got the blessings of uh, Reverend Saranakara, who said he would try to give us a place, a temporary place before a permanent place is set up. Uh, so we are working on that area. Uh, it will be uh, maybe next year uh, we'll get this place. So our rational light, our rationale is that Buddha has opened a holy life to all who want to go forth. And uh, at that time, he didn't create a ten percent man. He didn't say, oh, you can be Métis only and nothing else. He just, uh, because the first woman who approached him was uh, uh, Maha Pajapati, and she just said, I've already shaved my head, I've changed my clothes, now I want to ask you permission <laughs> to uh, give your blessings and to be a nun. So he agreed to do that. In fact, he asked his monks to help to also ordain the, the women. Uh, he just give them permission. At that time, there were no bikunis who could help to uh, ordain the first women who uh, want to renounce. So he just give permission for the monks to do it. So the monks actually have that mandate there, you know, to do it. Just matter whether through all the years of tradition and uh, practice, minarus, they feel that they cannot, they cannot do it because there's no bikunis sangha, there's no uh, bikunis, five of them to, uh, to ordain, to help uh, the monks to ordain. Because now you need five bikunis and five bikus, isn't it, uh, to ordain, to fully ordain a nun. So Theravada, some of Theravada countries like Thailand, uh, Myanmar, they never had a bikuni order before. So now if you ask them to start, they say we cannot start because there's no Bikuni Sangha in the first place to help. We monks alone cannot do it. But if they go back to the original uh, monks at uh, uh, Buddha's time, Buddha did it and he asked the monks to do it. Huh? So there's hope there, huh? there's some hope there. <laughs> hmm. So in fact he he felt that the, the bikuni is a very integral part of the uh, sangha. And then, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, when Reverend Ananda uh, asked him, why is it that you, you rejected uh, the queen, the ex-queen? Huh? Why did you reject her three times? We never know what is the reason. There could be many reasons. Like during that time, the, the society it's not really very uh, receptive of women going for in the first place. No one has done it. And moreover, the status of women is very low at that time. Their place is only in the kitchen to serve their family, to serve their husbands. So to let them go forth and be a nun is just not heard of. Uh, and, and also, the, when there were 500 women coming there to, to ask him to, to ordain, the logistics, you know, just the sheer loss, this logistics would have really caused him to, to hesitate. Because then you need a lot of monks to train the nuns. You cannot say, just say, okay, I uh, allow you to be a nun and just leave them on their own. So he is responsible to also teach them, get his monks to teach them, the senior nuns, and then where to house them, house them in the first place. There were no like kuti, so many kutis around. Not many hostels uh, or dormitories like what we have now uh, to house them. And also it was not safe for them to go into the woods alone to meditate, like the monks. So we had all these considerations and that's why he was hesitant. But when Reverend Ananda Jyoti, uh, no, Reverend Ananda, <laughs> you will be, uh, uh, when Reverend Ananda, in the end, uh, you know, cornered him, I think, and, and said, is it true that women cannot be enlightened? Then he said, no, women can be enlightened. 
Uh, he knew with his divine eye, with his, uh, his powers, he knew that women can also be enlightened. But he knew that maybe the time was not right, the situation was not, the conditions were not there to support them. But in the end, he, he still let them be ordained. And that was five years after his enlightenment, which is very soon, you know. Uh, it's not like 10, 20 years when a lot of things were established and more stable. It's just five years. And I think he was still trying to get his uh, meals somehow get established first. So it was a very, very uh, great decision for him to make. And we really appreciate him for that, uh, for that time. Uh, so there were some uh, suttas will say that uh, but Buddha predicted that if he were to admit the women uh, it will only the Dharma will only last 500 years do you all th uh, think that it is uh, true that it will only last 500 years and after the no more Dharma <laughs> so it's <laughs> yeah, because now it's already 2,600 years uh, later and moreover everything it can be stored up in the, in the computer already so it will never disappear the Dharma, <laughs> it's all stored up uh, but it's just that people, the people who practice it will dilute it and make it really uh, the, the, the Dharma becomes so diluted and the degradation can be there so it is up to us to really uphold the Dharma and to really uh, practice it in purely. So in order for you to do that, both the, uh, the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis need to really work together to make the Dharma pure, the Buddha's teachings pure. So even the eight uh, rules, you know, it could be added on. Just more many scholars uh, believe that uh, about the 500 years could have been added in by some of the uh, the Brahmins, uh, because many of them uh, do not want the, the people from lower caste to, to come into the uh, order, not only women, but people from lower caste. But some of them were road sweepers and all that. So to let them come in and sit together with the prince and with the kings and all that is just it, uh, it's something which they couldn't really accept. So then the women come in, so it's another area which they reject. So we don't know, uh, but many scholars feel that some of the uh, suttas that were added in or caught in the commentaries, the language used is not as ancient or as old as the, the real suttas that in the four Nikayas. Uh, they were not ancient when you look at the words, when they try to decipher the words. Uh, So scholars question the authenticity uh, of this uh, prediction. Uh, if it's true, then it would have disappeared by the first century AD. Okay. Uh, so in fact, the Anguttara Nikaya says that the good Dharma declines when the fourfold Sangha assembly uh, dwell without respect for the Buddha, without respect for the uh, Dharma, and Sangha, and also without uh, uh, the training, the Samadhi and the heedfulness or the mindfulness. So if all this training is not there, then the Dharma will decline, not because they admitted the women into the Sangha. Okay. So we, let's quote some of the uh, suttas, the, the Buddha's words uh, on this issue. When he was enlightened, in fact, the uh, Mara asked him, "Now that you are enlightened, why don't you pass away? You know, and just be like a uh, this particular Buddha, just uh, uh, without teaching other people." But the Buddha said, "I come not to, I shall not come to my final passing away." He said, the "Evil one." until my bhikkhus and bhikkhunis so he added the word bhikkhuni also bhikkhuni means none eh? because some of you are new <laughs> to it uh, and without the layman and the laywoman 
who come to be true disciples, who are wise, who are well disciplined, who are apt, apt and learned, who preserves the Dharma, living in accordance with the Dharma, abiding by appropriate conduct, and having learned the Master's word, are able to expound it, preach it, proclaim it, establish it, and to reveal it, explain it in detail, and make it clear. When adverse opinions arise, they shall be able to uh, defend or refute it thoroughly and well. To preach it, this convincing and liberating Dharma. So these are actual words huh, that Buddha said to uh, Mara. So he also considered the well-trained bhikkhuni as one of the pillars of his uh, teachings. Uh, in fact, there were a few nuns who were uh, very prominent during his time. And you can see, huh? so one of them is uh, Mikuni Kema, who became uh, most eminent in wisdom, very wise. Uh, and then uh, this Upalavana, she had psychic powers. When she wants to visit the Buddha in his uh, uh, mansion, she just flew from a few hundred kilometers and flew to meet the Buddha. She has very psychic powers. And Badachakachana, great spiritual penetrations. And they have uh, success, reaching success, and become Arahants as well. And the Buddha, he, he was not hasty in his uh, decisions. There was, in fact, one nun who became pregnant when uh, she was in the order. So everyone said, wow, oh, it will be, be scandalous, you know? You have, you have to expel her. She cannot stay here, because otherwise it bring bad reputation to the order. But the Buddha doesn't react that way. You know, he was a great listener. And he was a great, uh, full of compassion. So he said, no, let's just uh, form a commission. Like what, we have the royal commission now. So he also formed a royal commission. At that time, it was 2,600 years ago. And he got a king, so it's really a royal commission. He got a king to preside over the, uh, the committee. And he got uh, Reverend Upali, who was good in the Vinaya rules. The, the best person in Vinaya rules. And he got a, a woman also, you know, to make it equal, he had a woman, and that's Visaka, Sister Visaka. It's a very rich woman, donated a lot of money. So they meet, and then of course the woman, uh, Visaka, will uh, check with the nun and all that, uh, perhaps uh, when her last menstrual period and all that was. So they found out that she was pregnant before she joined the order. So the king uh, allowed her to go uh, through her confinement and he took the baby over to the palace and brought up the baby. And that baby became the very well-known Arahan, uh, Reverend Kumara. Uh, so if he were the son of the woman uh, and she would have lost uh, the lady, the nun, who also became an Arahan and he would have, they would have lost uh, Reverend Kumara who also became an Arahan later. Uh, so he was, he, he didn't react, so he was very good. Uh, so when Reverend, uh, Venerable Sariputta devised a teaching that really shows the path uh, that all the Buddhas take. So the Buddha was very happy and said, you expound it, you share it with the bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, and the lay man and the lay woman. <coughs> so he always <coughs> excuse me, remember the fourfold sangha. He didn't say, ah, okay, you share with the bhikkhus. And that's it, huh? So now let us look at the Malaysian scene. What would the what would the Theravada tradition be like thirty years from now? If we look at the demographic, we would know that the most of the people who are in the Theravada, Theravada tradition are the Chinese, with a small uh, number of Sinhalis in Malaysia. Like in Western countries, it's a growing uh, 
affect the Sang a growing community which makes up of the Caucasians and the Asians from Asia. So it's a mix. But in Malaysia, they are mostly from the Chinese community. Eh? And let's look at the Chinese community to see the danger signs there. Chinese population has dropped from 45% in 1957, that's our independence time, uh, to 24% in year 2000. And they predicted that in 2010, because they have not done the, the, the survey yet, they predicted it to be 22.6% drop. So why is there a drop there? I'm sure all of you know. Huh? Why is there, there's a drop in the population? One child. Huh? <laughs> One child. Ah, they don't give birth to more. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, but we don't uh, we look at the other races. We look at, say, like the Chinese. Huh? Ah, why? Why is that? Expensive to bring Expensive to bring them up, huh? And then more uh, women also like me and a few others don't get married, huh? remain single. Uh, and when they, they marry, they find it yeah, too expensive, they have many children, so they stop at one or stop at two. So even if uh, two uh, is just to replace the parents when they pass away next time. So it's zero population growth or even below zero now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> because some only stop, stop at one, so it's even not able to replace both parents when both parents pass away. Yeah? Uh, and then many will send the children overseas for studies. Uh, and then they say, I prefer my children not to come back. <laughs> you know, yeah. not to come back for various reasons. Huh? Difficult to get jobs and all that. Mm. And then they also migrate. The parents also, the whole, whole family migrate. So there will be more uh, migration. So in the end, there will be a very, very small community. So if the Theravada tradition don't wake up <laughs> and buck up, you know, <laughs> it will end like, like uh, what I say, you know, you'll get fossilized <laughs> like a, a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, especially when the activities uh, are so uh, not up to date or not, uh, not uh, as interesting as what the other in religions or what the other traditions are doing, uh, it is just uh, they have to make it uh, interesting for the youth to engage the youth huh, nowadays. So many convert to other faiths. Other faiths are very uh, aggressive huh, in trying to convert, uh, and some go to other traditions. Buddhist really traditions like Mahayana or Vajrayana. Huh? So, okay. Migration. And also, there are less men who are spiritual than ladies. So, you go to any retreat centers uh, or, or Buddhist centers, you will see there are more women devotees than men, also, huh? wherever it is. So, whether we like it or not, even in Thailand, they did a survey. And they find that uh, less monks are interested to be monks. Uh, sorry, less men interested to be monks. Huh? And the women are coming up because they could go overseas for, <coughs> for ordination. And they, in fact, I was there during the last Sakadito conference. Uh, and I stayed in a non training center, Raman Damananda, uh, the, the Raman Damananda, her and one morning we went to Pindapat with the nuns. There were four, is it four? Yeah. Four a Siladaras, that means ten preceptors. They are not ordained, fully ordained yet. So when they, they were so, you know, they, they walked, you know, like not distracted like in any like, in, in, in uh, monastic. Huh? They were really walking very straight and eyes you know, focused and very uh, mindfully walking to get their food, even their blessings and all that. The, the people were very touched, you know, uh, because all the while they never had nuns coming for Pindar Park, usually in the monks. So all the way there were many devotees, both men and women and children, waited for them 
along the shops, along the road, to offer them food. And there was a, a devotee who pushed the cart to carry the extra food uh, for to bring home to the temple. Just too much of offering. It was so much that the cart was it's a big cart and was full, you know. And it was so heavy for her to push. I can see. And yet the people were just putting in all kinds of food and fruits and flowers and all that. And they want blessings. But according to Reverend Damananda, the blessing is not from the, the nuns who bless them. The blessing is from their own meritorious deeds of offering the food to the nuns who uh, help them to get uh, the, the blessings. So they themselves get the blessings from their deeds, meritorious deeds. Huh? So that was, I thought, wow, it's a different perspective, you know. Because you see, you want the, the monks to bless us, no? With holy water and all that. But it's, no, it's, it's your effort of coming to the center, offering the food, offering the food for both monks and nuns, or doing some tapia uh, work or whatever. Uh, that is the one that gives you, you the blessings. Huh? Or fundraising, like what you do. Huh? And in fact, that day also, uh, in Sri Lanka, she said, three of her nuns received full ordination. Ah, four, sorry, sorry. There were four nuns from her center who went to Sri Lanka to get full ordination. So when they came back, when they come back, plus Reverend Namananda, there will be five. So at first, I didn't. I was joyful that there were four monks, eh, four nuns on the twenty fourth of June, who were ordained. Then when she told me that, wow, it was so joyful because now they have five. And what does it mean when they have five? Okay. They can ordain already. She can ordain already. Wow. But I thought, oh, the the feeling is really very powerful. So in fact, she could accept uh, anybody who want to go there to get the training for the two years and after they get fully ordained. Okay. Mm. Uh, and also, presently the lay Dharma speakers are aging like me and a few others. I'm already 65. So they are aging. So we need more people, you know, whether it's Sang lay or, or uh, it's Sangha. To, to really get uh, come forward. And moreover, we are very limited in our Dhamma. We huh? can only speak on limited topics. Well, not like the Sangha, not like the Bhikkhunis and Bhikkhus who are well trained in the Dhamma. Uh, and some Sangha members also objected to lay people giving Dhamma talks because there's not enough, not enough of Sangha members to come and give Dharma talks. Huh? So otherwise, you know, there would be a vacuum there. Some are even very uh, territorial. Or oh, you don't practice this way, that means you cannot come to a center to practice this meditation technique. Uh, that is, I, I thought, you know, it's uh, not far sighted because you lose a lot of devotees that way. Huh? Uh, some will also focus on self liberation. Uh, they want to just meditate, uh, go, you know, many, many times to do retreats. So in the end, uh, there'll be less people who also share the Dharma. Hmm? Of course, they, they want to, to follow the spiritual path and they want to do retreats and all. But even the Buddha and his disciples all didn't go into the forest and have retreat uh, 365 days a, a year. They also come forward. And in fact, the Buddha says, Go f uh, forth and spread uh, the Dharma, which is good the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. And no two person will go the same way. That means we cannot say, hey, come with me, la, I, I'm alone, I'm so scared of going to this village to, to preach, you know. I ah, come together. No, he said, you just go different ways. So then the, the monks and nuns will cover more areas, isn't it? No? When they go different ways. So he also encouraged everyone to go and share the Dharma. Whatever level, if we are in this level, we can share it with children, say for instance, school children, <laughs> uh, Sunday school children. So when you are a bit more nervous, then we can share 
older children like that. So I also started by sharing with very young children. Huh? Okay. Uh, so, so what are the benefits of supporting the Derivada uh, community? Uh, communities? So it is to continue Buddha's aspiration. So Buddha has already aspired to have the fourfold Sangha. So now that one leg is is uh, gone or missing in some countries, some countries have been brought back, like in Australia, England, America, it has been brought back. But in some Asian countries, like Thailand, Myanmar, Malaysia, uh, it's still not brought back. Huh? So, and what is most meritorious uh, indeed is that if we help it to bring back and to help Buddha's aspiration to bring it back, isn't it even more meritorious than any other deed that we can do uh, if we make it uh, really come uh, true? Uh, so it will give them the opportunity uh, to develop their full potential and to achieve liberation at the same time. So it also enables the bhikkhus to also share with them their, their knowledge and their skills and their experience. So it is also very meritorious for them to help to give them the opportunity to share with the others. Uh, these are mentioned, they have uh, women, uh, renunciants have measuring skills uh, and can play a very important role in counselling pastoral work with youths. So women devotees more comfortable in, in confiding uh, with uh, in privacy with the nuns about their personal problems I mentioned. And they can be also a network with other women, uh, whether in local, in Malaysia, or uh, in, with other nuns all over the world. So they can network, share experiences, they can uh, share their challenges and also see how they can work out these uh, challenges. Uh, also, as I mentioned, it gives opportunity for the lay devotees to uh, practice generosity towards them and a meritorious deed to help them uh, do together Dhamma Dutta work, for instance. Because like in Vietnam, the nuns and, and the monks work very closely in uh, most of the uh, charitable uh, work. Like if there are any disasters or floods and all, both the monks and nuns just work very closely and they find it more effective. In fact, in Vietnam, there are 7,000 nuns. <laughs> yeah. when, when we had the last second interconference two years ago in Ho Chi Minh City, there were 2,400 participants and many of them are nuns from Vietnam. The 2,400 are from all parts of the world, about 32 countries. And in fact, every province, there were so many nuns who wanted to attend the conference that the government had to limit them to only 10 nuns from each province. Otherwise, it would be a very, very big number. Yeah. And in fact, some of the monks, the senior monks, were more supportive of the nuns than the monks. Then the, when the young monks uh, complain, they say the women, uh, when they give the nuns more money, uh, uh, requisites money to, to support them, the young nuns, uh, young monks were very a bit uh, dis, uh, displeased. They see why the, the nuns get more uh, requisites. They say the nuns have more needs than you, the young men, so of course they need more requisites. And in fact, when they see very uh, bright nuns who had the potential to study. They sponsored them overseas to Sri Lanka, to Myanmar for studies. So some of them. Uh, and many of them uh, helped to run the, the temples. In fact, uh, the Mayana monks from Taiwan, I can't remember his name, is it Reverend Ching Yun or somebody? He says, in order to run the temple, I need to have one nun only. 
because it's just like one leg kick, you know. The nun can be the driver, can be the cook, can be the administrator <laughs> for the temple. Well, well, if I were to get a monk to run the temple, I need three. <laughs> I need to get one cook <laughs> and one driver and one administrator. So that's why when uh, they start the uh, centers overseas in California, he sent a nun instead to do stuff. Huh? So everybody has got their skills, you know, the monks and nuns. It's just that when they complement each other, they can even produce miracles, you know, very good work. So I covered that, huh? they don't need to go to a friend's house or lay devotees and all that. So what are our strategies? How can we help to build up this uh, support network? So we need to establish a center for them, at least a safe place where they can stay and they can practice, even if it's temporary, because many of them are still uh, under training overseas. Excuse me, some are trained but they are overseas work, uh, uh, staying overseas so they are not coming back because they say there's no support here so why do I need to come back? But once they know that there's a support group and there's a place for them to stay, some might come back. Uh, so a, it's for them uh, a place where they can develop their skills, develop uh, their personal growth, it's also a transit place for the renunciants, like when they need to come back to visit their relatives for some reason, they have a place for them to stay. Uh, also visiting nuns who are here. Recently there was one nun from Myanmar. Uh, when she needed a place to stay, we were looking around where that we can find a place. So in the end, we put her in Reverend Singkan's place at the Mahayana Temple, <coughs> which is suitable for her. Then, on the day when she was to fly back, one of the Dhamma brothers, he, he offered to take her to the airport, but it was 4 a.m. in the morning, and he stayed very far away for him to come from Sha'alam to the uh, Ampang, Ulu uh, clan there, it's very, very far. So he put her in another temple, a Theravada temple. But that was 31st December, and everybody was having like all night chanting and all that. So he was so afraid that the caretaker would not be able to get up in the morning at 4 o'clock in the morning to open the temple, open the place for him to come in. Then the nun would miss her flight, you know, so he was worried. So in the end, he just took the nun home to his house. He, he, he stays, uh, his son and daughter-in-law all stayed with him, so it's not like he's alone. <laughs> I mean, actually for by right, you cannot, uh, as a man, to take the woman in your car and take her to your house. But he had no choice. The nun was in her 50s already, uh, not a young nun. <laughs> so, but it's not the age, uh, it's just not proper uh, sometimes, uh, at night, you know. So, but he had no choice. So, the uh, next morning, early morning, he could take her to the airport. So, all these things, it is a good intention, but it's not, not suitable. Uh. So having a place would be more suitable. Uh, so we need to fundraise to set up the center, invite teachers to be the preceptors, temporary preceptors. In fact, Aya Santini has agreed to come and be a, a temporary speaker you know, for two weeks. That time we have no not started the network yet, but individually I was already thinking that we need to, you know. So I just asked her, I said, if we start a, a nun training center, will you come and, and share with uh, them? She said, okay, okay, I'm very busy, but I can give two weeks. <laughs> but when, when Reverend Samarakara picked up the phone and asked her from Indonesia, she said, okay, okay, I will send it to one month. <laughs> come and train them. So this is how we network and help them to set up. Uh, to, uh, also to uh, using the funds to sponsor fully or partly any uh, renunciant who want to go for further studies. There are a few who have already done their PhD, a uh, few nuns from uh, different countries. So it would be good if Malaysia also has this scholar, scholarly monks or nuns. 
They invite uh, preceptors as mentors and advisors in the management and also operational uh, needs of the centre. Because we are lay people, we cannot, <laughs> we don't know what to do, and the nuns cannot be the manager of the place as well. They also need lay people to support them to manage the place. We need to do survey on who they are, where they are. You know, right now we don't know how many are there are overseas under training, who they are, where they are, uh, what are their needs. So we just cannot plan for them <coughs> without them being around, without them being involved. So it's like quite difficult. You know, we want to do something, but we don't think we can't, we haven't even discussed with them what they want, how can we plan. But then we wait for them to come back, it might take years for them to come back or to meet them. So, uh, meanwhile, what are we going to do? <laughs> so, like this. so, we need everybody uh, to brainstorm and to see how we can do it. So, maybe finding a place first would be good. So, now Reverend Ananda Jodi has already made, made a blog. Uh, in May, he made a blog and he made him write some articles there. Some of these, I really put it into the blog uh, and create an awareness first. Uh, and also, hopefully, when these uh, nuns who are under training they know about this and read in the blog, they will be encouraged to contact us. Uh, so, if you know of anybody, you can also let us know. Or any woman who is thinking of renouncing, I know of a few friends who are retired, whose children are already grown up, and they are already thinking of uh, going forth. But they say, oh, I need to wait a few more years, I need to work harder and save enough money so that I never know if there's no support I won't have any money to, to live on you know so I need to work a few more years uh, on the safe side uh, they said so so we need to know what are the needs <coughs> what are the aspirations um, and what are the like do they want to provide any service for the community uh, so that they get that they do support? Do they want to pursue academic studies? Or do they want to get higher ordination? We don't know. Okay. So they're holding back some of them huh? because of lack of support. So we also need to know who are the supportive Theravada bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Who are they? Uh, how they can help as advisors or teachers? Who are uh, the supportive sangha from other traditions, from the Mahayana tradition, from the Vajrayana tradition? There are people who will come forward eh, when we need their help. So, who are the supportive lay devotees? So, I'm sure all of you here will, in one way or another, help to support when it comes through. <coughs> We need a pool of professionals who can help in many ways, skilled workers, trainers, or to run the center, uh, to be administrators, provide services like fundraising, transport, maintenance work, kapiyas, you know. So these are some of the bhikkhus who were supportive of the sangha. In fact, you know, the, uh, there was one the Sayadaw, who is uh, Sayadaw, uh, the Mahasi Sayadaw's teacher, who 50 years ago, he wrote in an article uh, which is called Can an Extinct Bhikkhuni Sangha Be Revived? He is actually uh, the, the, the teacher of this Mahasi Sayadaw and Tumpulu Sayadaw. And indeed, inside the, the article, he, he also mentioned some of the issues, the, the points that I mentioned just now, why it is possible for the bhikkhuni sangha to be revived. I will share with you uh, later. Um, so these are some of them, uh, Ajahn Brahma Wamso, and this venerable from Sri Lanka called Venerable Dodam Buddha Revata. <laughs> It's a quite long name. Uh, so they were the ones who first ordained 11 women in Sanat, India. 
1996. And presently, Venerable Inamalue Sumangalo was the one who uh, ordained a few nuns in Sri Lanka in his temple, and the four from Thailand was at his place who were ordained. And our late chief also was uh, supportive. So uh, Yuban, uh, rather Yuban, uh, I know, I think many of you all know him. Uh, he also wrote a very interesting article called A Lotus at Dawn, Opening the Doors to the Theravada Bikuni Sangha. So his article can be downloaded. So I have just quoted a few things from his uh, article. He mentioned, a revived Bikuni Sangha is a lotus at dawn. Whether it is greeted by storm, sorry, whether it's greeted by the warm rays of the sun or broken by storms of rejection are now choices within the Theravada communities. So do I have a lot I don't have time? Mm -hmm. The, the different interpretations of rules regarding the ordination of bikunis. I don't know whether you're interested in that. You want to go? Yes. The time? Huh? I briefly go through that. Huh? Okay. So in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Buddha said, Sangha was, a, was actually permitted to abolish the lesser rules. But then the Buddha didn't mention what are the lesser rules. So I guess he just left it to the discretion of the monks and nuns to use their discretion to know what is the lesser rules that need to be abolished. And also, he, he was, I think, very far-sighted because he knows that in a few thousand years down the line, that society changes. So if he were to limit, you know, to only a few changes or determine what are the changes to, uh, to be made, then we won't be, our hands will be tied. He just left it uh, to the discretion of the people down the ages to think which are the minor rules that are no more relevant to your time. Then use your discretion and do it. Uh -huh. The dual ordination rule was part of the eight rules accepted by Hajapati Gotami. So these eight rules also some of the them say that it could be some added on, uh, it could be less than the eight rules, but it could be added on, we don't know. Uh, uh, so as there were no bhikkhunis to form the dual ordination quorum, the Buddha gave the monks this right and privilege. So it's up to the monks whether they want to take up the privilege or not, uh, uh, to, confer, to confer the first batch of women. I permit you monks to confer full ordination on bhikkhunis. And also like the practice of the common British common law eh, uses the precedence of past uh, decisions as valid decisions for a, to be applied today. Like anything that uh, has the, the incident that has happened, the British common law will use the incident as a precedence. So now the argument is that the people can also use this precedence of the first batch of women who were ordained uh, without the, the two dual sangha. Uh, the, the monks just do it. So there could be no greater precedence than the authority and decision of the Buddha. Uh, so another argument is that the bhikkhuni sangha of some Asian countries like China, Thailand, eh, sorry, China, Taiwan, and Korea, they were descendants of a group of a, a monks and nuns from the Brahmagupta, a Dhammagupta school, and they originated from India. So they had the same Vinaya rules as the original group in India. So when they went to China, Japan, and Korea, Taiwan, their Vinaya rules hardly changed. They still kept in the purity the Vinaya rules. And the ordination of monks and nuns used only Vinaya rules. You don't use any of the Dharma to, to ordain the Vinaya rules. So their argument is why can't we use 
the ones that, that is still being practiced in, in China, Taiwan and all that and ordain them, which is what they did in India, huh? in Bogaya. They call the nuns from uh, Korea and Taiwan from the Dhamma Gupta group. Sorry, Dhamma Guptaka group to ordain. So the Tibet, uh, Tibetan uh, monastic systems was also guided by the Vinaya from the Mula Sabhastivadin groups. So the, the Vinaya is also originated from India and they kept it in their purity also. They don't change the Vinaya groups. So both are from the early Indian Buddhism. So the historical records also show that in the year 429 CE, that means Common Era, that means after uh, the Christ, AD year is known as AD uh, of 432 CE two delegations from Sri Lanka uh, two delegations of Sri Lankan bhikkhunis they were headed by a bhikkhuni called Devasara who conferred the dual ordination in China to the nuns in China so they also were brought from the Sri Lankan tradition to China so now if we were to get back the, the, the nuns from China to obtain someone say in Thailand or in, in, in Malaysia, there was no break in the lineage, it's just that it goes. In fact, uh, during the, the wars in the early Sri Lankan history, I think it's 11th century, there was the war actually eliminated the Theravada tradition. Actually, there were no more monks and nuns left. But fortunately, they went to, Thai, to Myanmar to get uh, back the, the monks' uh, ordination. But since Myanmar doesn't have a nun ordination, uh, sorry, uh, Myanmar doesn't have nuns, they couldn't ordain back the, the nuns in Sri Lanka. So only the monks were ordained, reordained. Uh, so, uh, so that is the history. So it is possible for the Theravada bhikkhunis to receive back this continuous and unbroken lineage. So the point is that if the Mahayana nuns have different religious beliefs, is irrelevant if they think that it's irrelevant as ordination is a matter of vinaya and not beliefs so even if the Mayana nuns have a different set of beliefs than the Theravada nuns it is the, the vinaya uh, rules that apply uh, not beliefs so in conclusion it is a great meritorious act, as we mentioned, to re revive the fourfold Sangha. And, and in fact, Brother Prem said, Give a person to do what he or she loves best for the Dharma, and you will receive a miracle. So we have good reasons for this to happen. And human beings are very creative. If you want to do something, it can be done. Mm -hmm. As what uh, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream and we need this conviction and commitment to make the dream a reality. So as Albert Einstein said, you can never solve a problem on the level on which it was created. You have to go to a different level to solve the problem. Uh, you cannot solve the problem on the same level as when it is created. And Mahatma Gandhi, to quote him, said, Be the change you want to see in the world. So if you want to see a change in the world, be the change yourself. Hmm? When we are stuck with finding an answer, the question that we can ask is, What would the Buddha want us to do? in such a situation today. So if we get, keep asking this question, what do you think the Buddha would want us to do in this difficult situation? Not only in this ordination, but in many situations. So if we keep talking to the Buddha and say, Buddha, you know, please, 
Here's an answer. <laughs> maybe you don't need and all that. So maybe you can get an answer. Huh? And it's through his Dharma, you know, not, not so much as he's talking to us. He's, he's talking us through his Dharma. And if we are deep into his Dharma and really learn his Dharma, we can find the, the wisdom to get the answers. Hmm? The insight. Okay, so uh, this uh, this uh, block, uh, you can see the, the address, huh? and this is my email address if there's anything. So now we can have some special answers. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh,